You can have the best relationships and most dominant gameplay, but still lose because you haven't convinced your peers at the end to vote for you. In today's video, I'll be looking at 5 individuals that range from a strong to almost guaranteed chance to win the game, but threw it at the final Tribal Council. Exemplifying this at number 5 is Twyla Tanner, who in Vanuatu seemed to have a lot going for her. The jury consisted of majority females that she spent more time with due to initially being on the same tribe with them, and not to mention they were an alliance for a good portion of the game. Adding on to that we have her aggressive gameplay style, which was starting to receive a lot more viability due to it appearing effective in the Amazon and Pearl Islands. So what could go wrong for Twyla Tanner? Well, the answer to that is Twyla Tanner. Twyla got on a lot of individuals' nerves through her argumentative personality and constant swearing on her son's life. Not to mention Chris had seemed to kick her into overdrive with his final words, telling her he won't take crap from the jury and expects her not to either. So when Eliza demands an apology from the so-called deceptive liars, Twyla takes none of it. In summary, her jury management was abysmal as she calls Eliza a spoilt little brat and that she should have been thankful any insult she said about her was to her face. Yep, that's how you win jury votes on Survivor. In reality, Twyla should have realised the power swap and that the jury had the power of that tribal and not to so bluntly speak her mind because it was a death sentence. Chris proves this on multiple occasions, buttering up the jury with these fantastical essays about how sorry he was to the point you can see Jeff visibly realise what's going on. To make matters worse, she then abandons her ideologies, even stating to Sarge that it isn't worth $1 million for her to be lying on her son. By the end of the tribal, Twyla says sorry to everyone, saying the game played her, which whether genuine emotion or fake, to the jury it shows she was only willing to apologise for her game after Chris and abandons the only thing she had over Chris and that she played an extremely selfish calculated cutthroat game for the million which gamers on the jury would have respected. But hey, at least she didn't stick to the whole usual honour and loyalty spiel. On the topic of that is number 4 Mike Turner who just did that. When Jeff said drop the 4 keep the 2, I do not think he meant to have a final tribal pitch that would win back in 2001. This is the modern era of Survivor where the jury is looking for a holistic game that encapsulates many attributes in Survivor as possible. In fact, on the topic of old school Survivor, we even got a return of the Let the Jury Speak segment with various jury members hoping Mike would break out of the nice guy routine and admit he exploited his social relationships, thus showing his game had variants. This transpired into Tori's opening jury statement, assessing Mike as the your word means something and value your handshake kind of guy. And multiple choice time. Do you think he said he was A, an honourable gentleman? Gentleman, B, an honourable gentleman, or C, an honourable j- I'm noticing a pattern here. In response, Mike wholeheartedly agrees, which juxtaposes Marianne and Romeo, who wanted to clarify one of Tori's remarks about them and add a little more flavour to their games. But Mike abides by the honour code. Now this isn't a death sentence of a game to stick by, but there's a reason barely anyone modern day stands by a completely quote unquote moral game as it presents two issues. Firstly, as I've alluded to earlier, with a 26 day advantage fueled season where the entire cast are pretty dedicated Survivor fans, they want to vote for a versatile game. But secondly, stating you're playing an honourable game is rather one note and a pitch that can easily fall apart if someone can prove you weren't as loyal as you claim. And the person to call Mike out is... himself? Immediately after saying he played the game as honourably as humanly possible, he then admits to, yeah, backstabbing Rocks Roy, which isn't a good look. In fact, after some prodding from Chanel, wondering if people were lying to Mike, alongside Hi and Omar, during another Mike impression, Mike's pitch collapses in on itself in the back third as he verbally questions if he actually had as much integrity as he thought. Considering he had bigged himself up as this golden man so much earlier, it's almost like erasing a narrative you were trying to construct. 
In regards to narratives, at number 3 is Sharn, perhaps the most iconic runner-up in international Survivor history, considering she's made it to the end twice, and lost twice. However, we'll be focusing on her Champions vs Contenders game today, which is once again another example of sticking to the loyalty narrative that doesn't work if disproven. Now I've so far refrained from going into other finalist pitches in this video, so we can see tribal throws within a vacuum, but this is the exception. Both Sharn and Shane push forward how loyal they are as individuals, and therefore the jury will be voting for who abides by that principle the most. This then transpires into Brian calling out Sharn, who said she had heard Matt's name circulating at his boot, and then he asks if she told him. This causes Sharn to crumble as she struggles for an answer. Sharn was floundering like a fish. But don't tell Ryan that. Even despite Sam and Benji telling the final two they needed to show off their active games to get the votes from the gamers, Sharn largely refused, instead trying to prove to Matt she was loyal. This was over Shane, who had never faltered in her loyalty to the main alliance, with the game so covert Sam had to ask her what active moves she actually made. Had Sharn actually put her big gameplay moves at the forefront of her pitch, especially since Matt himself was a student of the game and could have looked past her not being 100% honest with him. He also doesn't end up voting for her, causing her to narrowly lose to Shane at 5-4. All in all, Sharn was tied up like yarn and got roasted like chicken parm. But don't tell that to John. From two timer to another, at number two we have Amanda who as we all know is renowned for her amazing tribal performances. While she participated in season 15 and 16's final tribals, I decided to go with China. In this tribal, Amanda sits there completely uninterested, and while I, as an individual with an awful resting face, can understand where she's coming from, the fact she was called out by the jury for how she looked should have caused her to switch to looking more interested. She then also has this seeming crusade to apologise for everything she did in the game, and while this can be seen as a way for her to appear like the better of the two evils between her and the villain this Todd Herzog, it becomes extremely transparent to the jury. Moreover, it weakens further arguments she tries to make, like claiming credit for organising James's blindside, which seemed to directly contradict her opening statement. During trying to break the world record for most apologies from a single human, Amanda announces in the opening she voted for some people she didn't think she'd vote for. Frosty, Jean Robert, and James. That's half the jury. Ultimately, in spite of her impressive triple threat game that would have been extremely tough for any finalist to rival, Amanda instead devolves into this overly apologetic individual who is repeatedly outclassed. And now, at number one, love, respect, honesty, and compassion, it's Coach. Perhaps the most well known case of an individual who could have won the game had they confessed to it. Now Ozzy is renowned for saying fairly entitled and or odd statements on the show, however I have to admit I wholeheartedly agree with his jury speech. He efficiently tells Coach he's done well to get to the end as a veteran and frankly announces this tribal boils down to whether he can give himself the chance to win the game or throw it. And so Coach embodies his name with the biggest slam dunk of his career. He still tries to claim he was honourable, a narrative you can tell annoyed Brandon who felt betrayed, but says yeah there were times he was dishonourable. Further ideologies he tried to push were also plucked apart by Sophie and Albert that announced he wasn't the leader. He was carried to the end and valued loyalty over winning. Coach by the end of this tribal was a massive hypocrite, claiming to have this fantastical moral high ground when in reality, when the objective facts came to life, he had betrayed people. Even Sophie calls out his fake idol story, further accentuated by Cochrane, who tells Coach he knows he was manipulative, but he respected it. But both didn't cause Coach to change his narrative, and his closing words contain him apologising for not being honourable enough. 
had Coach actually owned his game, admitting he strung people along, and actually admitted, unlike his past two seasons he was playing strategically, he probably would have won. But instead he banked on making others feel sorry for him, or something like that? I don't know. But thanks for watching everyone, I do appreciate it. As you can see, we're just on the cusp of 2,000 subscribers, so if you could drop a sub, then that would be appreciated. If you like this video, here's another where I talk about 5 professions that failed on Survivor. But nonetheless, have a great day, and PEACE!